Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and here to answer your questions tonight, Shadow Innovation Minister Claire O'Neill, People's Panellist Greg Day, who's concerned about short-term thinking in politics, columnist and commentator Grace Kelly, author, editor and podcaster Jamila Rizvi and Victorian Liberal Senator James Patterson. Please welcome our panel. Thank you very much. Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio. Well, we're hoping to get to quite a number of issues tonight, but our first question comes from Bronwyn Bryant. Good evening. Political commentator Nikki Savas's new book about last year's Liberal leadership stoush contains some scathing revelations about Scott Morrison in the months before he became Prime Minister. Yet to many people, Morrison comes across as totally bland and boring. Is there a lot more about him that we need to know still? Yeah, James, um, there's a lot more coming out in these books, isn't there? What are your reflections on the Scott Morrison we're starting to learn about? Well, my experience with Scott Morrison is what you see is what you get. Uh, he behaves the same way with his colleagues, uh, privately, off air, as you see him behave in a television interview or out in the community campaigning uh, in the election. Um, I participated in the documentary that went to air last week and I spoke to Nikki Sava for her book because I was a participant in those historic events and I think it's a important... A Dutton supporter initially? Yep, I was. And I think it's important that people who do participate in those events make sure that the truth comes out about those events because I think they're a legitimate matter of the historical record. So do you think Nikki Sava is getting to the truth? Because we heard, and we've heard this from other sources incidentally, uh, that Scott Morrison's backers voted for Peter Dutton, or many of them, in the first spill to inflate his numbers and make sure that Malcolm Turnbull's position was terminal. Well, what, um, if that's the case, uh, could Morrison not have known about it? Well, what I was going to say, Tony, is that, as you pointed out, that I was a Peter Dutton supporter at the time and I completed those, both of those interviews prior to the election result being known, um, so I had no knowledge that we would have won the election that he would be Prime Minister. Uh, I wasn't critical of Scott Morrison or his supporters then and I'm not today. I think they acted uh, with integrity throughout that week. Um, they did what all of us in that party room tried to do, which is to put the best interests of the party, the government and the country first and to make a difficult decision. Uh, it was a difficult week for everyone involved, but ultimately I think we've landed in the right place as the election has shown. So you would have seen the famous footage of Scott Morrison after the first spill, putting his arm around Malcolm Turnbull and saying, um, this is my leader and I'm very ambitious for him. Was he ambitious for his future back in the private sector? Well, at that point, Malcolm Turnbull was still the Prime Minister and the signatures required to have a new party room meeting for on Friday hadn't yet been gathered. It wasn't clear what was going to happen there. And I believe that Scott Morrison was supporting the Prime Minister as he said he was. Uh, and but his when... supporters were not. You accept that? Well, some of them might have been going out and campaigning, but I think they did so because they believed that change was necessary. And like every other member of the party room, they had their same right to put forward their concerns, to communicate that with their colleagues and to seek the change that they thought was necessary. So do you agree that as the Prime Minister contends, his election victory effectively wipes away all of these questions about how he became Prime Minister? Tony, I served brief briefly in our first term for the entirety of our second term and now in our third term. And in my time in politics, I've never seen a Liberal Prime Minister with the authority and goodwill that Scott Morrison has. Uh, because he won an election that so many expected that he would not, he has incredible authority within the party room and we've changed our leadership rules in a way that makes his leadership more secure than any Liberal Prime Minister before him. Uh, so yes, I think we will move on from this. A lot of the participants in that uh, have left the parliament voluntarily and there's a real new determination and unity in the government to, to move forward and to deliver for the Australian people as we promised we would in the campaign. Uh, Jamila, what do you think about this? Because you were there behind the scenes when another Prime Minister was brought down by oh, his own Oh, don't colleague. bring it back. Don't yeah. bring back the memories. <laughs> yeah. Talk about Kevin Rudd here. Yes. Uh, I was working uh, for the Labor government at the time um, and had previously been in Kevin's office. And my experience was that up close, you experience it very differently to the public at home. You realise that there are real people involved, there are real people with staff um, mm. who are all about to lose their jobs and it becomes, I think, a lot more palpable. But 
one thing I know for sure, and this is with the greatest respect to our political colleagues here, is I don't think you end up in the House of Representatives without a little, bit, little part of you at least thinking that maybe you'll be Prime Minister one day. So um, what about the question whether Scott Morrison, whether we really know the true Scott Morrison or whether as the different accounts of how he became Prime Minister uh, came out, we're starting to find a kind of ruthless side to him not the hand over the shoulder or the arm over the shoulder, but something going on behind the scenes? I think the two can coexist. I think you can be the guy who says, how good's Australia every five seconds? <sighs> and, you know, how good's my wife? How good's the country? How good's... The... Honestly, just come up with a new line. You can be <laughs> that guy with the sharky's cap and be fair dinkum in that sense and also be a really shrewd political operator. And I think to say last week it hadn't even occurred to me that I might be Prime Minister and I harboured no ambitions whatsoever and then whoops, tripped over and look what happened. <laughs> Nobody buys that. Australians are smarter than that. And I think there's nothing wrong with being up front and saying, yeah, I wanted the job and I saw an opportunity so I took it. Back to how good is Australia? <laughs> let's, uh, let's hear from our people's panellists. Greg, um, Greg Day, what do you think? Um, and do you think people care one way or the other? Now the election, the votes have been cast, new Prime Minister. Do people care about um, looking under the stone as to what was there before he became Prime Minister? Certainly I do. Yeah. Um, to, to me, the excerpt of Nikki Savage's, uh, Nikki Savage's book that I've seen, it just reinforces that you know, politics to me or politics as usual is broken. Um, and rather than focusing on, you know, the long term, uh, sorry, long, the issues that are confronting Australia, of which we have a bunch, and um, in the long term, governing in the long term national interest, we've got a egocentric bl blood sport. And it's, um, personally, I just find it's not, um, it's not in our country's best interest that we continue like this. And this is why I think, you know, as, as a nation, we need to have a conversation about, is this how we want to be operating? Is this how we want to uh, be governing ourselves? And how can we do better? And that's, and that's not aimed at an individual or a party or anything like that. It's just we need to do much better than we are today. Um, look, there's no doubt that Scott Morrison won an extraordinary, uh, historic Absolutely. victory. Do you think in... Well, he's, he wants people to move on and, and forget about these issues which are coming out now in a series of books. Peter Harcher wrote about uh, it, referred to a kind of duplicity uh, when he was expressing loyalty to uh, the, the, prime, the former Prime Minister uh, Malcolm Turnbull while simultaneously his people were working against Turnbull's leadership. Yeah, and, uh, and I, don't, I don't think that would be a surprise to, you know, to most people. I, I, think, I think Australians know that our politics is you know, as far from clean and so I, I don't believe that would be a surprise in the, in the slightest. Claire O'Neill, you can reflect on this because you've lived through it um, on mm. your side of politics. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear that question and, you know, you and James sort of going back and forth about signatures and subterfuge and who met with who and all this sort of stuff. And I just, I actually find that I can't find it in me to care about this. I, I actually don't want to hear any more. And it's really interesting to me, Greg, that you're the people's panellist and you actually say that this matters to you. I'm the politician. It, it actually doesn't matter to me. And the thing that is really worrying me about this is that I don't want to see three years of politics like the three years we've just seen, where the Liberals have tied themselves in knots instead of focusing on governing the country. And the thing that worries me about all these new books and things that are coming out is that it suggests to me that people haven't moved on and they need to move on because... But to does be that frank, mean the political history... The, the detail of what happened doesn't matter? Um, maybe the detail matters, but we've got this very high rating show right now, you know, the pivotal moment in the program. And instead of pushing James on what Scott Morrison's third term agenda is and what he's going to do to help my constituents with rising energy costs and the state of our schools and, um, you know, pensioners who need... Um, dental care, here we are talking about this stuff. And yeah, no, we're say... talking about it for a couple of minutes because these books have just come yeah, yeah, out. And... We're just learning new things. Yeah, and quickly, what... I'll just quickly go back to the question because uh, you obviously asked this because you're interested in it. What do you think about the answers that you're getting? Fair enough, but I just wonder, is this really the best that Australia can produce in term of, terms of a national leader? OK, yeah. well, we'll, leave, we'll take that as a comment, literally. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
Let's hear from... I, oh, sorry, can go, can I just yeah. quickly say, I, I think one of the reasons why I'm reacting so strongly against this is because it is leaving Australians with the impression that Greg has, which is that this is all politics is, and it's not. It's actually not what I spend my day doing. We represent the people in our communities faithfully. We work really hard for them. And telling people that all politicians do is sit in their offices and scheme and try to raise petitions and subterfuge, it's actually not what the content of politics is and it just really distresses me that your perspective out of this conversation is that that's how we spend our time and it's, it's not right. Well, well Labor did spend a lot of time doing that. Now the next government spent a lot of time doing that so I think uh, people like Greg are right to express some cynicism about your answers. Yeah, they, they may do and you know Greg it'd be great to spend a bit more time with you and talk to you about some of the things that we do do every day in our offices because just Despite this dominating the news coverage, we are actually trying to do a good thing for the country here. We're trying to represent our constituents and it's actually, it's, it's not what we do all day. Yeah. I, I understand and I'm not, I'm not saying that is what you do all day or that that's the main agenda. Mm. But from, from my perspective, the, the country has a lot of challenges yeah, ahead of it yeah. and we just seem to be unable to move on on a whole bunch of issues. Energy policy is an obvious one, but you know, strongly linked to climate change. And we just we just need to move as a country. We need to. We, you know, Australians expect our politicians to to you know, reach a compromise, reach a bipartisan solution of some sort, and just get going with okay, it. Okay, we're going to we're going to find out whether there's compromise afoot on the tax issue in a minute. But Grace, just on this issue of the books coming out of uh, Scott Morrison and the activities of his people and so on. What do you think? Mm. Oh, well, I mean, look, Nikki's last book was fantastic and I'm sure this one will be great. Um, but, I, I mean, look, it is what it is and it is of interest to a certain portion of the population. And I, I'm not concerned that Scott Morrison may or may not have the capacity to be ruthless. To be honest, I would probably prefer that the country be run by someone who does that, have the capacity to be ruthless when he needs to be. OK, well, let's move on to actual uh, issues. The next question comes from Christopher Boer. Since voters resoundingly rejected Labor at the May 18 poll, the public has seen internal division within the Labor Party over support for the Coalition's tax package. Is Labor's disunity out of government going to destroy our economy? Oh. Claire O'Neill. Well, no, um, we're not in government, so that's, that's you know, if anyone's destroying the economy here, it's certainly not the Labor Party. And I'm glad you raised that because the context that the, the tax cut discussion is happening in is in an, an economy that's deteriorating really quickly. So you probably know that we're in the third quarter on the government's watch of a per capita recession in Australia. The ordinary Australian household at the moment is seeing their living standards go backwards. We've got underemployment and unemployment much higher than it ought to be and these things do need to be addressed. The tax, cut that, the tax cuts that's the, that, that the government is proposing, I think, are a good way for us to stimulate the economy, and it's really obvious now that the government does need to step into this situation. Um, we are supportive of most of what the government is trying to do. However, there is a part of the, of the coalition's tax package which is not meant to take effect until 2024-25. So I've got a child that started prep this year. These are tax cuts that won't take effect till he's in grade six. Um, those are the most expensive part of the coalition's tax package and we're not necessarily opposed to it. What we're saying is that we would like to see that section of this package delayed for a little bit so we understand what type of economy and what type of budget situation that decision will be taking place in. So it's not because um, those future tax cuts benefit most the big end of town, which is an argument that was made in the past, not so much at the, time, yep. at the moment. Yep, I, I mean, I think that's a relevant factor, Tony, and one of the reasons why the stimulus that's going to be um, given by these initial tax cuts is because those tax cuts are going to mainly low-income people, and we know that when we give low-income people tax cuts, they spend the money pretty much immediately, and that's urgently what the economy needs at the moment. So, but is Labor in danger of stumbling over its own rhetoric here? Because the idea of there being a big end of town, mm -hmm. we're against it, has been thrown out now. So... Yep. Um, and yet you're saying that we're against these tax cuts because they go to the big end of town. Um, no, actually, I, I didn't say that at all. What I'm saying is that the government is trying to put pressure on Labor to make an economic decision which has very significant ramifications, especially for the budget. If we take... Um, tens of billions of dollars out of the budget, then something's got to give. We've got to see cuts to services, to pensions or other things that government does. And they have a significant economic impact. Now, there is no need for us to make a big decision like that for something that doesn't take effect until 24, 25. 
Okay, it's, Claire, it's, it's I'm a gonna, long time Claire, I'll, I'll let you come back, but I'm going to go to James Patterson to sure. hear um, the government's perspective on this. Um, what's the problem with splitting <coughs> uh, these tax cuts? Let the lower end of the income spectrum get their tax cuts straight away um, with Labor support and worry about the, um, those a number of years down the track, worry about them later? Because, Tony, it's a comprehensive tax reform plan. It proposes, as Claire says, rightly, immediate relief for low and medium income earners, uh, but also like people, that, things that people like Greg are calling for, which is some long-term tax reform as well. I think it's critically important that, under our plan, 94% of taxpayers will face a marginal rate of tax of no greater than 30 cents in the dollar. That means if you're earning anywhere from $45,000 a year up to $200,000 a year, you'll face no greater than 30 cents in the dollar. You won't face any artificial disincentives to taking on more hours, working harder, taking risks, starting a business. You'll be incentivised to do that. That's really important for our medium and long-term economic growth. But it's very clear from Claire's comments tonight that the Labor Party has learned nothing from the last election. They might have changed leaders, they might have changed their rhetoric a little bit, but their policies are the same. The war on aspiration that they took to the last election, they are continuing with today. They're standing in the way of tax relief for Australian people. Um, let me quickly go back to Claire on that. Mm. And um, I mean, do you accept that the government got a mandate yeah. in the election for its whole tax package? It was all out there, mm -hmm. it was in the public, and the section you're talking about was in the last yeah. budget, so it was clearly laid out. Why not yep. accept their <clears throat> mandate? I think there's um, a limited mandate that was achieved through the election. And the reason I say it was limited was... Um, is for a few reasons. I mean, the first thing is that the government um, didn't run an election campaign based around the detail of its tax cuts. You all experienced the election. The key message that came from the government was that you shouldn't vote for Labor, you shouldn't trust Labor and you shouldn't trust Bill Shorten. Now, no, no issues with the fact that you won the election. I completely well, Claire, accept that. Claire, you'd, you'd, just... you'd have to agree that if they had one consistent policy, yep. it was to cut taxes and this was all laid out in the budget. Yep, and um, I'm getting to that, Tony. So the, the second stage of the tax cuts, which, um, which Labor has uh, taken a position on, on is something that we originally didn't support before the election. Now, we do accept that there's a limited mandate there and that's why we've changed our position. We agree that the second phase of the tax cuts should be allowed to go through the parliament and we will support it. In fact, what we're saying to the government is why don't you bring that package forward? The economy is in a difficult spot right now and under that proposal, every single Australian would get a tax cut over this next term of parliament. But it doesn't mean that the coalition has a mandate to do something, which is probably two elections away. It happens in, in five to six years, okay. Tony, I'm, and that I'm, is just I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring in our other panellists because we need to hear from them. Greg, first yeah. of all. Can I just add to that of um, the mandate? Uh, in, my, in my view, um, the coalition didn't win the election. The, the I, I really don't think the Australian people um, wanted to vote the coalition in. I think they just wanted to vote Labor in less because of... The, the greater you know, package of, um, of reforms that were put in together. And personally, I think um, Scott Morrison ran a very strong campaign that got the coalition elected and Labor didn't run a good campaign and misjudged a set of policies. Would it be policies. fair to say, Greg, if you remember one clear policy, it would be, we're going to cut taxes? I think that was the only policy. Mm. Yeah. So do you think that they got a clear mandate then? Uh, as I said, I think um, I think Labor was voted out rather than um, rather than or, or, or the the country didn't want Labor as opposed to the country did want um, coalition and and you know and, and I appreciate the the desire to move on but um, but it's still fresh in people's minds and and mm. sorry can I just add one more thing to that if you look at Victoria so in November the coalition um, at, at the state level took a took a real bath and. Um, and I think a lot of people expected that to be repeated in the federal election, and it wasn't. And I think a big part of that was that uh, people who voted for the Labor government, the Andrews government in Victoria, couldn't vote for the, the, uh, a Labor government federally. Uh, Grace, uh, taking you back to the tax cuts, um, there are two arguments here. One mm. from Claire, which is quite a complex one. Uh, one from the government, which is a simple one. We've got a tax plan, mm. we've got a mandate for it, mm. and we're going to put it all through or none of it. Mm. Uh, and if, if it's none of it, Labor will be the blockers. Mm. What do you think? Oh, look, I think it has to be passed. Um, there's, there's two issues. Uh, because, of, because bracket creep isn't indexed to inflation, over time, we just all pay more and more tax. And last year, the average household, uh, the tax bill for the average household went up by 8%. So if you want to know why everything's so expensive and cost of living is so high, taxes are a huge part of that. You can't 
um, pretend that they're not because they are. And you can say, well, tax the rich. OK, just tax the rich. We're all connected in this economy. We're all connected. You can't tax one person in isolation or one group in isolation without a flow on to everyone else. Now, services have to be provided. There needs to be taxes raised for running you know, our schools, our hospitals, our welfare, everything like that. But at the end of the day, uh, governments need to be pushed, they need to be under pressure to provide services in an efficient and cost-effective way. And with this endless ratcheting up of tax, it's just endless and it's not indexed. So the government's plan is just really clawing a little bit of that back it's not clawing as much back as it should be clawed back, it's just a little bit. And so it's well overdue and we do need it. On the Pretty splitting big change up, taking the 37% tax bracket it's down to 30%. That's it's the It's fantastic because, difference. like James said, 94% of people won't pay more than 30 cents in the dollar. I'm sorry, but I think 30 cents in the dollar's enough. I think that's enough. Okay. And um, in terms of splitting it, why would you split it? Because if you do, in a year's time... The caravan's moved on and then you try and put that last bit up and then Labor will say, oh, but you're just trying to give money to the top end of town <laughs> and and the other, the first two bits will have been well, forgotten. Well, they might not use that expression no, anymore. we don't say that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, whoever, whoever invented the top they end might, of they town... They might think it, but they won't say it. <laughs> whoever invented that phrase, the top end of town, Scott Morrison should give them a million dollars because <laughs> it, it won him I the election. I think he's planning to, actually. Yeah. <laughs> can, we, can we be honest, though, about what the Coalition want to happen right now at a political level? The Coalition want Labor to vote against it. That's yeah. why they're no, keeping this all together. No, no, sorry, hold on a moment, because you've talked for quite a bit and I haven't. <laughs> There are three tranches here. Labor has shifted their position and said, you guys have a mandate, you took this to an election and people said they wanted these tax cuts. So we're going to shift a bit and we're going to give you the first two tranches. Now, you could vote them through, push them through the parliament immediately, come back a week later and start talking about that third stage and you could help people out at the first point. All that Labor said is that they are recognising that our economy is in trouble, that it is moving very, very quickly, and maybe we shouldn't put in major tax reform that isn't going to take effect for five or six years and make a decision about that now. In, on top of that, I think we need to take into account the budget that is currently in place, which is a budget that the Coalition took in the, an election year they were expecting to lose. And it is a budget based on a whole bunch of fairy tale assumptions around population growth, around economic growth and around wages growth that are not going to happen. James, um, first of all, can I just put one thing to you? Because um, you may not need Labor's support at all if you can get the crossbench support for the full package in the Senate. Um, will that happen? You're pretty close to that argument, I'd say, being in the Senator. I, I the truth is I don't know, Tony. We're hopeful that all non-government Senators see the light and uh, recognise our mandate and support the tax cuts, contrary to um, Jamila's prediction that we don't want that. I assure you, I desperately want them to vote for them and as soon as possible. Um, but I have to say this new concern of the Labor Party of the long-term budget implications uh, is not something that they showed when they were in government when it came to spending. Uh, because when they were in government when they came to spending, they signed the, they signed the country up and the government up to tens of billions of dollars of spending in perpetuity with no end date, with no concern as to what the future budget impact of that might be. So it's a bit convenient to say on now that we're considering tax cuts, we have to be only short term. We couldn't possibly commit for the long term. But, but you are committing to the long term. Uh, the next tranche or the last tranche uh, in a few years' time is $95 billion from the budget. That's quite a big commitment when you're not sure... Uh, whether your revenue is going to be under stress from a slowing economy. It, it's big reform, Tony, and we make no uh, bones about that. Mm. We're very proud of the fact that it is big tax reform because that's what this country it, needs. So is the, is the theory, the economic theory, that it'll all trickle down, it'll create stimulus and, in fact, that will benefit the economy mm. which is flagging? No, the trickle-down economics is a political epithet. It's not an economic theory. Uh, what we're actually proposing, Tony, is something that was set out in the budget very carefully and based on very prudent conservative assumptions. Uh, Do you know all... there's a really good prudent assumption that Australia's birth rate's going to rise to 1.9 in three years? That assumption's been in the Coalition's budget papers for the last four years. It's not budged. People are having less babies, not more. Peter but it's really Peter Costello for came the budget out. bottom line Peter Costello if you came out. You've forgotten Peter Costello came out and convinced people to have more children, and they actually did. At <laughs> least he had a policy to try and get them to have more children. These guys just think it's going to happen. Well, give them a week. We'll see what happens. <laughs> um, now, we're going to move on. The next question comes from Brooke Hutchinson. Um, Grace Kelly, do you support legislation that would ensure union leader roles 
are filled by fit and proper individuals following on from allegations of CFMEU boss John Setka's harassment offences against his wife. Grace. <laughs> That's a lovely question, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, well, yes, no, we do, we do need a fit and proper person test. Um, union officials, uh, like, like I guess other community organisations, churches, uh, charities, not-for-profits, they're all, uh, they, they, these organisations hold a special place in our society and they do have special privileges and unions especially have special privileges and so the people that run them do need to be held to the same standards. Um, they don't need to be held to greater standards but just to the same standards. Um, in terms of the, the uh, stuff against women, I think the wh where it seems that Labor has drawn the line in the sand with John Setka is that the um, ill treatment or, or um, you know... Harassment. Harassment, poor behaviour towards women has occurred in, in a private context, in a domestic context, and that's that's been the line in the sand. The victim sand. being his wife, yes. um, Emma Walters, and she argues that mm. he should remain a union mm. leader. Um, should, it, should that be taken into account, what his wife says, and she was the person subject to the harassment? Well, I think, I think the members will take it to the account. And look, unions are community organisations and the members elect the secretary and that's all there is to it. So if, if the members want John Setka, then they will have John Setka and, and that's, that, that's, you know, a democratic organisation. But could this but, legislation, if it's passed, and we'll talk about that in a little while, but if it's passed, could it prevent him from remaining leader? Ah, uh, yes. And I think this is what I was going to say earlier with, with the... You, you can't just think about the abuse or ill treatment of women in, in the private or domestic context. It, because it occurs in the workplace context. There are women who own construction businesses. I'm not saying John Setka's abused a woman in the, in the business context, but just unions generally. They deal with women in um, a business context. They deal with HR managers, female business owners, executives and so on. And so there is... Um, from experience, there's some pretty rough treatment that that goes on in workplaces, and um, I, I think it would be a good thing if we could just bring unions into the fold and just bring them into line with the rest of the community. I think member, I think unions will benefit from that. Jamila, what does the John Setka story tell you? Look, I come at this from two perspectives. Firstly. I'm a really proud trade union member and if John Setka were a leader in my trade union, I would be demanding an immediate vote to have him removed. I don't think the kind of behaviour that has been both proven and the allegations that continue against him are appropriate to hold that kind of leadership position. I also so does think... It, does it change anything at all in your viewpoint that his wife has come out and said he should remain? Yeah, I think the, the views of a victim are always valid and should be listened to, but mm. Ultimately, this is a decision about someone holding a leadership position, not whether or not an individual has forgiven him. And I think this is part of a bigger conversation that Australia is happening, having, that the world is having, which is this sort of messy, ongoing conversation as a result of Me Too about what standards of behaviour are acceptable and what standards are not. And I think it's a conversation that business needs to be having, government needs to be having, not-for-profits need to be having, and most definitely the union movement needs to be having as well. Greg, what do you think? And, um, look, I know that you grew up in a household where there was domestic violence. So do you have a personal reflection on this? I, um, yeah, I, I, I really struggle with, um, with some of these. I, I think for sure that um, all, all leaders need to be accountable for their behaviour, yeah, ab absolutely accountable for their behaviour. Um, in the military, um, in corporates, I've worked in corporates for about the last 20 years, you would, you would be straight out the door if you, if you exercise this behaviour. And the, and the corporates where... Uh, so I do a lot of work in infrastructure and energy. And the corporates where there is a lot, of, a lot of female leadership, you see... Or females in leadership positions, you generally see, in my experience, um, better overall behavioural standards. And, um, but as, but as, as I said, if you, um, if you behaved anything like this in a corporate, you'd be gone. You'd absolutely, absolutely be gone. Yep. James Patterson, um, the legislation uh, failed once. Mm. Um, tell us about the legislation, first of all, and because that was what the question was about mm. originally. Um, and will it be put again and will that happen soon? 
In a perfect world, Tony, you wouldn't need something like an ensuring integrity bill because the union movement would police itself. Um, even notwithstanding the events of the conviction of last week, prior to that, John Setka had been convicted 59 times of a range of offences, including assaulting a police officer. And until last week, until a couple of weeks ago, no one in the union movement thought that was a problem. No one thought that that was an issue. No one thought he should be expelled from the Labor Party or removed from the CFMEU. They thought that was all fine and merry and he should just continue. And there are 70 other officials of the CFMEU alone who are currently before the courts on other matters. So, so briefly, um, in the Setka case, would the legislation um, disallow him from running a union? What, what the legislation would do is establish a fit and proper person test. It recognises the fact, as Grace mentioned earlier, that union leaders have special legal privileges that other Australians don't have. And in order to get those legal privileges, you've got some responsibilities too. One of those is a respect for the law, uh, respect for people that you're dealing with. It's not acceptable, as John Setka did, to threaten the families and children of public servants at the Australian Building and Construction Commission just for doing their jobs. So what's the answer? Would, the, would that fit and proper test effectively be powerful enough to prevent a union leader with that kind of record uh, remaining a union leader? In the case of John Setka, it would be open and shut case, surely. OK. Claire, would you support such legislation? Well, we'll see what the government brings forward. I think one of the issues with all of these bills is that we want to improve standards, but we don't want to see... Um, part of a kind of vendetta against the union movement that I think has been pretty obvious, frankly, since day one. Um, so we're, we're happy to look at any legislation You blocked it with the Greens forward. in the Senate um, last yes, time but, round. But that's because I'm, not sure that, I'm not sure it's changing. Yeah. Um, so well, who, who knows? Who knows? We, we do need a bit more information about what it's going to look like and then Labor will be very happy to look at the bill. I think there's a, there's a bigger issue here than one piece of legislation in the federal parliament and that is that we've got an epidemic in Australia of violence against women, more than one woman a week being killed by their current or former partner. And we actually know that the single biggest thing we can do to make uh, Australia safer for those women is send really clear signals about how seriously we take this and um, build a society where men and women are more equal. We're gonna, um, you know what? We're going to come to that in the next question yeah. in more detail. Yeah. So but let me I just can, take you back yeah. to John Setka, and you know the case, yeah. the yeah. specific so, so case what I'm, what I'm saying that, to you that has that led your uh, leader, Anthony Albanese, to say yeah. he, should be, he should not be the leader of that union. You've just yeah. heard a whole series of other things. Mm. Um, do you think now it's time for legislation to make sure uh, that people who commit those kind of serial abuses... Um, do not run unions. Yeah. I mean, we, we don't have a piece of legislation before us that we're debating and the Ensuring Integrity Bill that James has referred to did a whole lot of other things that I think gave um, pretty um, concerning amounts of power to government and the court process to restrict the role of what are very important civic organisations in our society. But I don't say that to excuse in any way the conduct that's occurred here. And what I actually am saying is that there's an opportunity here for us to send a message about how serious this conduct is. And Jamil is right, you know, some of the things that John Setka has done were probably perfectly fine 20 or 30 years ago, but it's not 20 or 30 years ago, and we do need to show that standards have changed. That's why Albo's taken such a strong view on this, and I support him 100%. Okay. But, um, but what so about, but what about, sorry, but what about the all of the abuse of women that goes on in the workplace context by union officials? Does that not matter? Is it only when they do it to their own wives that mm. you draw the line? Because um, you... You are subject to abuse and um, dreadful treatment and I have dealt with umpteen examples of this over the years and it, it's, they, are, they are above the law and they um, uh, just do and say whatever they want and it doesn't... I mean, I've never been bashed up or anything like that but you do get some extremely rough treatment that's mm. totally unacceptable and nobody would ever do it. And it just comes across to me as really ridiculous that it's OK for union officials to go around and I'm not saying they all do it and I'm not saying it happens all the time but it seems to be it's OK for union officials to go around uh, abusing uh, and harassing women in the but workplace when they... Okay? Who they says do that is okay? Because, because it's gone on for years. I'm not years, saying that's but okay. But it's gone on for years. But suddenly when someone does it to their wife, on it's it's bad. I think that the, the stuff that, has, that you're seeing goes on in the workplace context all the time. Mm -hmm. All the time. And it's not just women it happens to, it's men. Yeah. But and I don't see anyone condoning that. 
on this panel, at least. No, no, no one on this panel has condoned it. But it's never. It just strikes me as a funny example to say, okay, now the line's been crossed. Mm. It's okay, kind Grace, of like... We're gonna, we're gonna, you've yeah. made that point. We're going to have to move on. Remember, if you hear any doubtful claims tonight, let us know on Twitter. Keep an eye on the RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Conversation website for the results. The next question is on a broader but similar subject in a way. Angelo Grosser. Hi. Um, Jamila Rizvi, you said in the past... Yeah. <laughs> you said I was in the, searching for that's you. That's fine, that's fine. Um, you said in the past that boys need to be taught to be more empathetic to combat sexist attitudes. Now, I know you didn't intend it to be so, but as a young man, I find it offensive to suggest that my sex is uh, not empathetic enough. Um, and so my question was um, in regards to, like, surely there are other ways to combat rape um, rather than alienating men when rapists are outliers and rape is a symptom not of masculinity but of malevolence. Jamila. Thank you so much for the question. Um, and I think, I suspect we're probably on the same page here. Um, and maybe I've expressed myself not as well as I could have. I have a, I think that the problems that manifest themselves in rape and serious sexual assault claims are problems that we need a multi-pronged approach to solving. There need to be programs that protect women, that support women who are fleeing violent relationships. There need to be programs that help to uh, help our police to be able to have the powers to be able to enforce and intervene when they need to. And I think we also need to look at how we socialise young people. At the moment, we still talk in this language that puts the responsibility for preventing rape and sexual assault on young women. We say, don't wear a short skirt when you go out at night. Make sure that you don't drink too much. Make sure that you keep yourself safe. I want to have a conversation that says, OK, but is it a young woman's job to keep herself safe from a rapist or is it our community's job to make sure that we don't have any rapists out there who are going to actually harm her? And I think there's, that is part of a broader conversation around how we educate young men and women. Can I, can I just interrupt just for a second? I just want to go back to Angela. I just, I just was hoping to finish answering his question, uh, though. OK, sorry, but I, I just want to hear his response to the first part of what you're sure. saying, and then he, you can come back and respond to that. Oh, I completely agree um, with a lot of what you said. I think the main issue that I would have... I'm a music teacher and I teach little boys, and I think often, you know, that kind of boisterousness of boys is, you know, uh, it's claimed that that leads to to rape and we need to calm down boys and they're not empathetic enough. And I, I, I think we should be combating rape. I just don't know if alienating men, um, I think that's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, you're more likely to create rapists by saying men aren't empathetic enough. Yeah. And I suppose my, my point isn't that I think men aren't empathetic enough or that boys are any less empathetic than little girls. Um, not at all. I'm the mother of a little boy and I'm trying to raise an empathetic little boy who loves music. So um, my concern is that we place a very different set of expectations on boys and girls. And we've changed the set ex of expectations for girls massively the last 20 years. We tell our little girls, you can be anything. You can be confident. You can be a CEO. You can be in the army. You can be a firefighter. I don't think we have done the requisite balance for little boys. We haven't said, it's OK if you want to be a dad full time. That is a wonderful aspiration to have. It's a good thing if you are interested in the caring professions or the humanities or the, or the arts. I think it's about encouraging and fostering that empathy and that interest in what we call left brain thinking in little boys and valuing it the same way we do for little girls, because I don't think we do that at the moment. OK, James, what do you think? Tony, I recently became a dad for the first time. Uh, my wife and I have a seven-month-old boy and we'll be raising him that uh, every human being is of equal value and equal worth and deserving of equal respect and that we'll expect him to behave that way when he grows up. And I think that's the best thing that any parent can do to make sure um, that their uh, sons and daughters uh, behave in a way that you'll be proud of uh, when you see them grow up. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I, um, I yeah, absolutely agree. I've got a 14-year-old daughter and a... Um, and a one-year-old son. Um, and, and my wife and I are already uh, talking about this, of where 14-year-old daughter is, you know, climbs trees and does parkour and, and everyone thinks that's wonderful. <laughs> everyone thinks that's wonderful, which is, which is lovely. And, and so my wife and I have the conversation, well, what about if our, what about if our son is into what would be, you know, traditionally uh, more, more girl, um, what would be viewed as... Um, you know, uh, stereotypical you know, girl sorts of things, um, and um, and we are we are absolutely fine. It doesn't worry us in the slightest. But we are aware of that societal 
you know, almost expectation or that difference in standard. What about there. Angelo's point? Um, and I think, mm. if I'm right, he's sort of saying it's becoming more difficult to be a boy. Mm. Is that oh, correct? Yeah, so definitely. Yeah, yeah. So, I so can I ask? Can I ask why you figure? Why you well, sense that? I, I don't. Male suicide rates are a lot higher than than female suicide rates, and I think it's great that we're talking about um, issues with women, which haven't been talked about until recently. But I think there's a big danger that we can swing to the opposite side, where we're demonising things that are traditionally masculine. So do you, and so you feel as though we're being demonised? That um, well, being I wouldn't demonized? say I ex ex exhibit traditional masculine traits, but. I can see in a lot of my, my colleagues and my students things that are, you know, pushed to the side because, you know, the classroom can't cater for that. Claire, uh, I'll bring you back in because I cut you off earlier yeah. um, when you want to make some bigger points <clears throat> about these issues. Yeah, well, Angelo, can I just thank you for your question and especially the tone of your question because it's really important for us to be able to have a conversation about this that's calm. Um, so I think... I, I disagree with you a little bit on how you've diagnosed the problem here. Um, I think the attitude that tells us that there's these sort of very small number of kind of evil, aberrant doers of, of wrong, it doesn't actually reflect the statistics that we know about violence against women and especially sexual violence against women. It's actually so common that it tells us that there are social things at work here that we need to address. The best evidence that we have is that making a society where men and women are more equal and a society where people like James has talked about are raised with really deep-seated beliefs about respect for others, that's the best thing we can do to fix this problem. And it does require us to change and provide more flexibility about what it means to be a woman and then what it means to be a man. What really distresses me about your question is that it feels like we're not getting the tone of that conversation right. Can I just talk to you about your point about um, mental illness and suicide in men? Women suffer in a world where men feel that they can only be one type of male. It's really bad for women. It's also bad for men. The best evidence we have is that the men who are having the most mental health issues in our society and the men who are most likely to take their own life, they are the men who are stuffing themselves into this box and it's actually men who feel freer to be who they really are that don't have those issues. So I don't know if you have any feedback for us as, as leaders about how we can have a better conversation about this, but we need to help men understand that this is not about an attack. This is about everyone being able to be who they are and be respectful of one another, and we will build a safer society for women through that too. OK, I think we've got a fair bit of feedback from Angelo already. Oh. No, I just, I just com I completely agree with mm. a lot of what you said. I just think now we're in a very different historical period, whereas before men and women were kind of separated in the working spheres. Yep. And now that we're put together, we don't know how to balance yep. this. Society's changing. Th yes, yep. exactly. Yep. And I think we have to be careful that we don't um, suppress one side and we don't vilify the other. Um, I think it's just a very hard issue to kind of tackle. Thanks, and I Angelo, that. for demonstrating what audience participation is all about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Grace, should we have a word on this? or, oh, uh, we, or we can? No, I'm, I'm happy to pass. We've okay. covered so many right. topics. Well, yeah. let's move on then. There's a question that is, in fact, directed mm. to you. It's from Gareth D'Souza. Hi, this question's for Grace Kelly. Oh. Part of Israel Folau's defence in his upcoming court case is that he is simply quoting passages from the Bible. Mm. What impact do you think the Israel saga and any Religious Freedom Act will have on employment agreements across Australian companies? OK, thank you for the question. Um, so, <sighs> there's so many issues with the, with the saga. At, at law, it's simply an unlawful termination. There's thousands of these. I think there were 4,000 adverse action cases last year and I think 60-odd or 50 or 60-odd made, made it to court. Um, the vast majority of these things are settled. Um, of the 4,000 that were settled, 58% settle for under $6,000. So we're talking about um, a bog standard employment law case. But it's occurred in this context where we're in the tail end of the same-sex marriage legislation and the connotations of that and um, certain sections of the community who feel, who are 
really hyper alert to some, the fact that something might have changed. So people of faith, some people of faith, not all, are worried that uh, something's changed and they've well, quite a lot, quite a lot of people of faith and other supporters have put two million dollars yeah. uh, behind yeah. the and case that Israel is... Folau wants to run. So yeah. here's my question, because you wrote about this yeah. um, in the Australian this week: um, Will it be a free speech case? No, 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 no. It's not. When when it goes to court, the the, the judge will decide: um, was was Israel sacked because of his religion, or was he sacked for some other reason? And so, um, in my opinion. Um, the, the judge will find that he was he was not sacked because he was a Christian. So, have you, by um, the way, have you explained this to your colleagues on the Australian who, on a daily basis, are running <laughs> I would say dozens of stories <laughs> which have a very different spin on what's going to happen and what is, this is all about? Well, I mean, we everyone has a different opinion at in the Australian, and everyone's like that's what it's that's what it's really about. Is. It's it's no. like a diverse range of opinions. Um, I think one of the real scandals of this case is the cost of the legal fees because that's outrageous. Um, this three or two, two or three million dollars that being, is being talked about, there's something very dodgy going on here because um, somebody's not telling the truth about that. It's a case that should probably run for an ordinary person, maybe 20,000, for a celebrity, maybe 100, maybe 200,000 at most. So why it needs two or three million dollars is absolutely beyond me and I don't know what I, I feel very concerned about. So you don't, you don't think there's any way of ramping this up into a religious free speech case? Well, I mean, it's an employment... The application... so that's where all the money would get involved <laughs> if it ended up going to the High Court, for example. OK, well, the application's made under the Fair Work Act. That legislation has been in place for 10 years. Nothing has changed. 15,000 people a year run unfair dismissal cases under that legislation. Israel's case is just one of those 15,000. <laughs> so, and that has happened for 10 years. And for the last 10 years since the legislation has been in, ca in place... The Commission and... Uh, look, the Commission has ruled umpteen uh, thousands of times on the social media issue. And at the end of the day, you, you cannot use religion as an excuse to do something that contravenes your obligations to others and that tramples on the rights of others. And I think this is where the argument is around. It's getting very heated on both sides of the fence. And my column was just to say, uh, take Hang a step a back, Reality check. Take, a, yeah. take a deep breath. This is not a freedom of speech case. This is not a freedom of religion case. This is an unlawful termination case brought under the Fair Work Act. It's been in place for okay. 10 years. It's an employment law case. All right, we've got a, let's we've, be realistic. We've got another question, um, and it's about the broader issue um, around this case, um, and it comes from Mark Rennick. Good evening. With regards to the Rugby Australia case uh, and the termination of Israel Folau's contract um, and the call for uh, protections for people of faith to be able to express themselves, can we, can, could the panel consider the position of a teacher working in a religious school? Many teachers working in religious schools have in their contract that they must uphold the ethics and ethos of the, um, the organisation that pays their wage and they accept that if they want to continue working there. Does the panel think that rugby league or rugby union players or sports people should be free from these obligations or should teachers be allowed to express themselves even if their beliefs are contrary to those of their employers? Jamilo, I'll start with you. <laughs> um, I think that's a fantastic hypothetical to put to us. Um, and the reality is I think it comes down to which prism you're trying to view this from and I think Grace makes a very good point that while we're often talking about this as a freedom of speech issue or a freedom of religion issue or a discrimination against minorities issue ultimately if it was decided in the courts we're talking about a workplace contract right and what someone can do under the terms of their employment and there are a whole number of um, roles within our society and positions within companies where you're expected to keep your own views private. For example, I grew up in Canberra, so a lot of my friends work in the public service and mm. they are limited in what they can say about their own personal political views uh, mm. on Facebook or That's social right. media, for example. Mm. A lot of us work for organisations where we can't say certain things. And I think with issues like this, you're always talking about a weighing up of different rights and competing rights and we like to talk about rights in this absolute fashion. Like, this is about freedom of religion and therefore nothing else matters. But 
rights compete and rights contradict each other all the time and I think mm. it's about a balancing act and it's about a society mm. saying what they value. For me, in this case, I was conflicted about the sacking decision despite the fact that I found what Falau said personally abhorrent. Um, I was conflicted about it because I worried it made a martyr of him. I was worried about the ultimate outcome. And for me, my concern was about the rights of LGBT kids and the kids of LGBT parents who are sitting here listening to this, watching this, hearing it unpacked in the media for weeks, whether or not them and their parents are going to hell. And I'm most concerned about them and their rights. James, um, what do you think? And well, there's two things to... Actually, you should reflect, first of all, on that question that was mm -hmm. asked, and I'll bring you back to the one that Grace answered. Thanks, Tony. And I should say, at the outset, I'm agnostic. I don't believe anyone's going to hell, um, but I do think that freedom of religion and freedom of speech are absolutely central freedoms in a free, liberal society like Australia's. Uh, I thought one of the best contributions made this week uh, is from a, a Labor figure, uh, a lawyer, Josh Bornstein, who asked the question... In this country, do we want corporations to set the pro what their employees can do in their own private terms and the limits of their speech? And how far do we want that to go? Do you because include as you point that out, churches? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm coming okay. to exactly that, Tony. Because as you point out, on this occasion, it is a social conservative in Israel Folau who's on the receiving end of this. But it's equally plausible to imagine that someone who works for a private company or a church or a school mm. uh, who has left-leaning uh, attitudes is also uh, the victim of this kind of action in the future. And I think as a country we will be poorer if everybody who works for a private organisation through their employment contracts has such uh, oppressive contract conditions that they can't speak themselves freely in public debate. I think we'll be worse off as a society if that's the road we go down. Now, very briefly, do you accept uh, the point that Grace is making that this case will not rise to a major test case on freedom of religion because it's actually constrained within an employment uh, law context. I, I partly agree with Grace. It certainly is a contract dispute, but it's taken on much wider implications and it is of great concern to As public debate, many but, Australians. but in law. But, but as it should, though, because, Tony, um, when you see someone who's prominent, who you're used to seeing playing football on the weekend, uh, lose his... Uh, promising contract and career as a result of something he said that's based on his genuinely held faith, of course that's of concern to Australians. And mm. Australians are going to expect that the parliament comes and deals with this in some okay. way after this case is finished. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Uh, Can I yeah, address yeah. that? Well, hang on. I want to hear from the other panellists first. Greg. Yeah, I was just going to ask, what, what do we think um, the ACL's response would have been if he'd, instead of saying something anti-homosexual, that he'd um, said, say, something anti-Semitic mm. instead? Would the, would the ACL be still, you know... Uh, fundraising for him and, um, and trying to make this a freedom of exactly. speech issue as well. All right, we'll leave that as a rhetorical question because I don't want okay. everyone to answer that one. But Claire, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I think it's, it's a really good one. Um, yeah, well, firstly, I think when we're talking about this matter, it is really important to acknowledge that this is a really hurtful conversation mm. for a lot of people and it's easy mm. for people who are, um, don't identify as anything other than straight to talk about this in a mm. philosophical terms, but for other people we are casting judgement on who they are as human beings and I just think that mm. needs to be acknowledged. Um, look, I have to say, you know, I'm, I'm amazed to hear what Grace is saying here, that this is just an open and shut unfair dismissal case. I mean, why have we had thousands of pages of copy written about this subject? I've basically heard of nothing else for two weeks and I don't know if I can add a great deal to the conversation. It sounds like James is ruminating on a, a new law over there to provide protections and I'm sure there'll be plenty of time to have that discussion. Can I do yeah, briefly, because we've got to... I'll be jump. very brief because that question's really important and people don't understand this. Um, religious organisations are exempt from the discrimination laws. So they can sack somebody because they're gay. So if you work for a church-owned owned school, you can be sacked for being gay because that, if that's in teaching, in keeping with their religion, they have an exemption. So religious organisations have an exemption, corporations don't. So corporations, their employees and their agents were all bound by anti-discrimination law. So it's, it's really ironic that... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, that's the law. I don't think many people realise it. And I think that the religious freedom debate is going to be very interesting because when, when everybody in Australia understands that religious bodies have this exemption, they're allowed to do this, uh, then I think that might change the flavour of the debate a bit, a bit. Grace, thank you for several reality checks there. <laughs> now, the next question comes from Eva Machingo. Hi. Um, last night, during his acceptance for his Hall of Fame, um, Logie's Hall of Fame place, Kerry O'Brien 
warned the Australian public not to let politicians diminish the public broadcaster. So my question is, what can be done to make sure the future of journalism is factual, fully funded and protected from monetary influence and government interference? Uh, James, and I'll get you to uh, focus on the ABC part of that, or the public broadcasting part of that question at least. Uh, <laughs> in, in, the, in the knowledge that since uh, 2014 you've been suggesting the ABC should be privatised. In my previous life at, life at the IPA, not in my current life as a senator. Oh, so they were so. views you'd no longer hold. That's right, that's right. <laughs> um, Tony, I'm, I'm very happy to take this question because I, uh, I didn't see Ter um, Kerry O'Brien's speech live, but I heard it replayed on the radio this afternoon. Uh, and it was like he was playing ABC opinion bingo card. He literally ticked off every predictable ABC opinion, one after the other after the other. And this is one of the problems that so many Australians have with the ABC and with the public broadcaster. And that is that the opinions are so predictable, they're so often left wing, and many Australians of a liberal and conservative outlook don't get a look in on this, on this ABC. And so I, is I it, is it, can I, can I just ask you, Tony. is it left wing or right wing to worry about the ABC funding cuts? which have had a profound, and I'd say this not, I say this just as a fact, have had a, a profound impact on the ABC's morale, uh, on its future planning, and what it will ultimately do with the money um, that it gets. And uh, we're going to see a lot of job losses as a result of those cuts. They will come. Um, do these things matter and are they left-wing or right-wing concerns? Well, Tony, I'm just picking up the concern that the chair of the ABC board, Ida Butrose, has uh, aired, that your managing director has aired, which the ABC does have a bias problem, they've both admitted. Um, but I also take up a point also made by Ida, which is that funding reductions for the ABC need not necessarily result in job losses. Uh, she presumably knows more about the ABC budget than, than you or I do. I'll take her at her word. Uh, but also, let's have a bit of a reality check about the ABC's budget compared to the budget of every other media organisation in this country. The ABC is exceptionally well funded, generously, by a billion dollars a year of taxpayers' money. Every other media organisation in this country has had, had much more savage cuts than the ABC will ever face. So I don't ever celebrate anyone losing a job. That's not a good thing. But let's put it in perspective. OK. Jamila. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, I listened back to... Um, the speech this morning from Kerry O'Brien and the three main topics that I, points that I took out of that, other than, you know, a little bit of a crack at Karl Stefanovic, uh, <laughs> was his commitment to seeing Australia close the gap when it came to Indigenous life expectancy and broader issues around Indigenous Australians, a commitment to press freedom and scientific reporting on the question of climate change. I don't know what is so blatantly offensive about those three <laughs> topics. Um, to me, that is not left-wing bias. That is really sensible middle-of-the-road policy making that I suspect the average Australian would be pretty on board with. Um, I'll, I'll let you come back on that. Uh, Greg, what do you think? Yeah, I, um, from, from, you know, I think a reasonably average Australian's perspective, that uh, what we what we need what we need in a, for a democracy to thrive is we need a we need a free press we need um, you know, un, we need a, an unbiased press and we need it with uh, enough resources to do the job to um, to investigate to to hold you know, to hold people to account whether that's whether that's governments or corporates or whoever it happens to be. And so funding cuts, funding cuts concern me, obviously. Uh, I don't know any of the detail enough, but my, um, my concern is just very much that we have a, a enough media coverage and scrutiny in, in the country and the, and the freedom to be able to, um, you know, for our democracy to work well. Claire. Great question. Um, I think the ABC um, does need more funding. And the reason I say that is because um, the rest of the media is just fragmenting before oh, our very eyes. True. And you can actually see it in it's the press true. gallery in Canberra. You walk up and down a gallery that used to be thriving with people investigating the conduct of people like me and James. And it's just a very different story at the moment. And it is affecting how governments work. In fact, I think a lot of the reason why we are obsessively focused on personalities and intrigue in politics is because it's cheaper, easier journalism to produce. Mm. Um, so we need an ABC um, that's well-funded, that's properly resourced more than we ever have before. That's, that's the reality. If I can just address James's question about bias, 
I can't believe the way that this is asserted when the ABC is the only news organisation in this country that by law must be balanced and independent. And the proof is in the pudding on this because despite the claims that this is, you know, some sort of majority of Australians who feel concerned about this, this is by far the most trusted news organisation in the country and we need to do more to support it. Grace. <laughs> Um, look, I'm not sure about the funding issue. I'm, I'm not an expert on the ABC's budget, but I will say that um, it's just a couple of issues. One is that, that just with technology, that's that's been a huge game changer for the whole landscape, and that's hitting in so many different ways. And um, in terms of money, perhaps I sometimes I think it's if you try to do too much, you spread yourself too thin and from what I notice as an ABC consumer, and I love the ABC and I, I'm, a, I'm a consumer of their media, I just think that there's a lot of sort of tentacles and a lot of stuff that I think, well, you could, you could bring it back and do a few things really, really well. Um, as to the issue of bias, I, yeah, I, look, I do think, I do think that it's, it's just, it's, it's not so much in the bias of the people, Tony, because I don't know how you vote. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you. Oh, no. It's my right as a citizen. So um, yeah. please continue. So um, I don't. Yeah, it's not so much about the individuals. It's more about the same topics that are revisited all the time. It's just like the the same sort of topics and the same sort of themes and the same sort of flavour. So except tonight on this program. Yeah, 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 exactly, you want, right? exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But um, look, I think I think it's a great organisation. There's always room for improvement, and I'm I'm. I have always been treated so well by everybody at the ABC. I really have, and I think that um, we're just scared you'll go of you, on Grace. To, you're <laughs> of me? Oh no! <laughs> I think no, you'll I'm go on joking. to bigger and better things. Look, there's room for improvement, definitely. And listen, money doesn't mean everything. You can do things really well with with less money. It's just about creative thinking and problem solving. I'll quickly go back to James' final word on this, and because um, we basically are over time, but um, you can't obviously advocate privatisation anymore because that's against government policy and you've anyway recanted your previous position. Mm. But what about uh, merging the public broadcasters because that's another thing that's been on the agenda. Is that something the government will look at and would you encourage them to do so? No, I'm sceptical about that. I think the ABC and SBS play different roles and are different organisations and have different cultures and very different legislation. As you know, the SBS is permitted to take advertising, the ABC is not. So I can't see how a merger would work and I'm not advocating that. And um, as for the future of the ABC, do you think we'll get the funding back? Uh, you continue to be generously well-funded by taxpayers, Tony. <laughs> all right. <laughs> we had to try, didn't we? That's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Claire O'Neill, Greg Day, Grace Kelly, Jamila Rizvi and James Patterson.